Hi everyone, my name is Marta Rybczyńska, but if you do not pronounce my last name, this is not a problem. Everyone tells me, calls me just Malta, and I understand. We are starting the day with security as we should be starting every day. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm, I want to wake you up today. Not with horror stories, but with other stories. The talk is called CV Check, all you wanted to know. But first I would like to have a, a check. How many of you have already used the CV Check? Okay, so most great, excellent, that's the first live uh, user survey. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. I'm going to talk about the basics. I'm going to talk about some recent features that ha I haven't talked about yet. And I had to make a slot in the presentation for a new feature that we have to have very soon. So I would like to tell you what is going to happen and why it's going to happen uh, so I, you do not get surprised when it actually happens. While starting with CV check, let's first start from the beginning. Why and how when what's going on around the place. So what is a CV first? A CV is in the security speak a way to talk about the same security problem without uh, does this buffer overflow that was discovered two years ago in that package that does this. It's not a very efficient way of trying to tell what you are talking about. So instead of talking about uh, git commits <laughs> um, for the fix, uh, the security people talk about the CVs. The CV idea is very simple. You have the CV prefix, you have the year, and then you have the number, unique number in the year. So as a total, it gives a unique number. This is handled by Mitre, which is a US government organization. Okay? But Mitre is not assigning CVs to every single software product uh, around the globe. They are managing the data database. They are, they are handling the lock on the database, basically. And the vulnerabilities are assigned, the numbers are assigned by many different organizations around the globe. So far, pretty simple. Uh, the CVE allows you to identify a special, a specific vulnerability. The format has its age and it shows a little bit because what the original form of CV doesn't have is a machine-readable version number and product name. So in the text it says in that software something happens. But as the number of CVs is reaching a number of um, thousands per year, we are currently using automatic tooling to deal with that. In far, uh, far a long time ago, in the it wasn't necessary, but now it is. So what we need is is a way to to automatically process it all, it all, it all that. CVE will have that later in the year in the new format 5.0. However, this format is going to be introduced at the end of the year only. It, they have been talking about it for a long time, but uh, we, for now we do not have the first entries in the format yet. CVE is not the only database for security issues. Other databases are GitHub Security Advisories, for example, when you, re when you do a GitHub security advisory, you may have a CV, but it's not necessary. So there are some issues that have the GitHub advisory number, but they do not have a CV. 
And there is the database that I like OSV also, that may be completely independent. So that's the, the general situation. Now, NVD. NVD is an extended version of the CV database. Basically what they did, they added the information that was missing in the CV database. NVD, this is National Vulnerability Database, hosted by NIST, yet again a US go uh, government organization, but a different one. What they have added to the format, we have machine readable product and vendor, and you have a machine readable range of versions of the software that are affected by the issue, which is kind of practical uh, for, for the open embedded project. And this is exactly this database that we use for the CV check in the open and embedded. The database changes roughly once per day. There are some new issues, there are updates of descriptions, so basically the database changes once per day. And how, when you, you there is a web interface, so you can look at an issue, at an issue and here we have an example, you have a, you have a link um, at the bottom. What do we have? We have the, the number, we have description, let's say, uh, that says what happens badly. This one is interesting because in the first sentence typically you have in which package it is and which, uh, which project. This one doesn't have it, probably it was too obvious for the person writing it. <laughs> um, we can figure it out by other means. In this case, um, you have the, the source, OpenSSS Software Foundation, so we can as assume where it comes from and we are going to confirm it in a moment. After the description, you have the severity. Uh, in, this, in this case, we have a base score 7.5, that, that is pretty important, and we have a vector. Uh, the vector is a way to encode what is the impact and how you can use the vulnerability. For example, if it's a remote one, if it's a local one, if, if you need privileges, <coughs> Uh, there are calculators that allow you to decode the whole thing. That's the, the beginning of the, um, of the entry, and then we have additions of, uh, of the NVD to the CV database links. So in this case, uh, you, uh, th this is unstructured for every different uh, advisory, it is different, but uh, we can find some pearls and interesting stuff in there. In this case, pretty well done. As a, as a first link, you have a link to the, co to the commit fixing the issue. What is pretty cool for a security researcher because if you, can, you can look yourself what is, be, what is broken and you have a, a link to the security advisory. So this one is pretty cool here. Then you have weakness enumeration. There's a standard um, that describes every type of a bug you can make. <laughs> and, and, and this is using that, um, that standard. And at the end, last but not least, product and the version. In this case, we have a CP, CP is the standard of the encoding of the product number. It's a CP from the vendor OpenSSL and product OpenSSL. So it is OpenSSL. And the issue is present from 3.0.0 to 3.0.7, including 3.0.7. So normally in 3.0.8, it's fixed. And we can look how the encoding looks like. If you're interested, have, have a look. But we have tools to, to do that. It's important to understand what's going on here, but you do not have to pass yourself. Now, why we use CV check in Open Embedded? You use CV check if you want to verify the recipes you have in your project for the no, for known CVs. Of, obviously, you can only verify for vulnerabilities that are known. Uh, unfortunately, um, 
my black cat with my crystal ball do not want to show me all the vulnerabilities that will be known in the future, so we cannot do that, but we can look what has been already discovered and published. And I'm using CVHX to trace status. As the database changes every day, you can see what has shown up day by day, week by week, year by year. And the check is pretty fast. Typically, it adds one minute, two minutes to the build, so you just, you just add it and you check. Now, a few warnings bef bef before I tell you how to use it. The CV check verifies the declared version only. <coughs> what it means, that you use the PV, and when there are some smart people who override the hash of the source code key while keeping the version to something else that gets out of sync. And uh, we do one verification per recipe. What means that um, for recipes that are downloading different combined projects, uh, the big example is MetaZephyr, we, ca uh, we are not verifying all of the modules, libraries, and other things that Zephyr has brought in. Only the Zephyr source code itself. When you are fixing a patch for a security vulnerability, to make it work with CV check, you need to mark the patch in a special way so that it works. And remember that if you run CV check twice on your machine, it may give different results because in the middle you may have had a database update. So if you run it today, then you run it in a week, the results will be different and that's normal. Now, and how is, how is pretty simple? The only thing you need to add in your local conf is inherit CV check, and then you run every build as usual. And that's it. Add the result, a little bit reformatted to make it uh, easier to understand. What you are getting is you are getting warning for every unfixed CV that is in your build. Here for the Linux kernel, I mm, removed most of them because there are too many. This is from the build of Open Embedded from Friday. Uh, so we have a warning on glibc, qmu, and uh, Linux Yocto. The, then we get the links to the CV reports, and I'm going to explain that more in detail later. We have two formats and we have two types of images, but I'm going to get to that. And you are, you, you are going, you, you, the, the reports are saved in, uh, in, in separate files that you can post-process later. Now, output formats, an important thing. We have two times two, uh, two <coughs> formats, and now mm. let's, uh, let's, get, uh, let's, um, let's um, explain that. You can have report for the image you are building, for the image, it means for the root FS. It is, in this case, it's not including toolchain, bootloaders, on, uh, all things of, of that style. And you can find the, the file when the report is in image CV reports stored in or image CV JSON reports stored in. And then you ha also have the complete report which includes everything that was in your build, including toolchain, bootloader, firmware, everything. Um, oh yeah, and there's an error in the slide, of course. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, the location is prefixed by complete, um, complete report. Now, Two, uh, two file formats, JSON and text. 
they have exactly the same content. JSON is a machine readable that is newer format I have had recently. It's available since downfall, but it is disabled by default, uh, by default in downfall. It's enabled by default from Kingston. And if you want to have it, uh, the, the, the right variable to set is CV check format JSON. The text format is a lega legacy format. It's pretty easier to look into manually. And uh, the, there's the right variable for this one too. More about two formats, why I, I added the JSON format was in a talk. And so today in, uh, in half an hour, I, I'm unable to re retell the whole story. But, but you can watch it. That was uh, Yochta Project Summit uh, in May uh, last year. Since that, um, I've been working on post-processing scripts, and not only me. And there are some examples that you can be inspired from. Um, I've written scripts for the Oniro distribution, and you can download them uh, from the um, uh, Oniro repo uh, from Eclipse. Uh, they are three big scripts I have, the reporting, that creates statistics. Uh, it can also, it can, it can even create a spreadsheet if you want to have a spreadsheet for the management. Uh, then I have uh, my analytics scripts uh, checking for recipes without CVs. Recipe without the CV may mean that there are simply no known issues, which is pretty cool or may, um, may be an indicator of other issues like the mismatch between the machine readable product name and the real product name that's being used. So those are things I'm looking into and uh, verifying if, if the results are actually correct. So that's probably the, the easiest script to understand. Yeah? Uh, I was working on a project at Atlas Costco and they had something called Create Your Day and you could do whatever you wanted to. And I chose to create release notes. What I did was I, whenever <coughs> I built the Yocto package, I created the appropriate la LaTeX files <laughs> for that package. So at the end of the build, I just ran a program and I got release notes as a PDF file. You, you I'm ready. Yeah, yeah def definitely that's something that you can do. Oh, no accidents, no accidents. Um, the advantage of the output of the CV check is also that you have all the packages. So yeah, one of the scripts could just generate the release notes also. That's an easy thing to do. There's one more question, yeah? Um, these scripts will just become part of the... Oh, sorry. Um, these scripts you're mentioning, will, they, will this become part of Open Embedded? If people, if people want to. If, if people are interested, of course, they are, they, are, they are simple scripts written in a simple way so that people can understand how to, how to, uh, how to write their own because everyone has different needs. But definitely I can, I can move them to, to a panel, but that if people are interested. Mm, so, and there is a third one, more complex. It's doing a diff between two results of uh, of the CV check, so showing which CVEs have appeared, which have disappeared, which packages have appeared. Yeah. Uh, can we get a microphone? Uh? Thank you. Um, going back to the update of the database and the check against that and how that might change each day or over time. Does it have something like its own commit hash itself so that you've got a unique version of that database that has been checked against that is then stored so when you diff, you know exactly what you've, you've compared between? Yeah, yeah it, it, it has. It's not machine readable yet. That's probably something we need to, uh, to add. Cool. So okay. that we can, we can diff also the date. Uh, uh, the, it's in the comment, but we may, we may add it. Yeah. We used uh, we, we used Google's repos manifests, so we had an old version manifest and a new version manifest. That made life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
as I said, those scripts are available currently from Oniro and also Steve for his emails, for his Sunday emails of the statistics of the open and embedded project. He's also using this, this format uh, scripts are, um, are using the same logic. We, we wrote them at the same time, basically. So it's pretty, uh, pretty widely used already. Now, uh, this is an example of me running the, the CV report, the, the, the small script on the, on the rootfs uh, example report and the summary report of the exactly same output that I had before. So on the, on the rootfs, we have issues with glibc and in Linux, in total 100 CVs. Uh, that is not exactly the same what has uh, what Steve uh, is reporting because he's including uh, most of the kernel CVEs uh, because um, they are old and it's a, it's a, another long story. <laughs> um, and the CV report for everything for the summary, apart from the glibc and the Linux, it has also QMU. And that's logical because um, the QMU does the QMU native. So it's not, it's not in the rootfs image. So we have also two in the QMU. So the total is 102 that compares, that, that matches 100 from the other. One, one type of a usage. Uh, would there be also a report if we build an SDK? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for the SDK also. Yeah. Okay. It works for SDK too. Now, there are a few options to control the fetcher. The fetcher that is downloading the database from NVD. A certain things when if you, uh, that may be interesting to you if you are building over multiple machines, if you are building on systems that do not have network access, all things happening. Now, as I said, the database changes once per day, and the <coughs> complete download of the, of the database in, is w uh, around 150 megabytes. So if you can avoid downloading it all the time, uh, it's better, so we are, we are fetching the update. And you can control the frequency of the fetcher. By default, it has a positive, uh, the variable is CVDB update interval, by default, uh, it's one day, so it's a number of seconds during one day. You can verify that's, a, that's the number of seconds. But if you put a negative value, like minus one, then uh, it will never download the database. It is useful in a case when you are fetching on one system, you are copying the database to another system when you want to use it, and you or you are doing unit test and you want to always have the same result from, uh, from the check. So this, uh, this is uh, useful in, uh, in certain configuration. And then if you know that you want to download the database right now, for example, you are running CI. You want to fetch the database now and then use that database with all of your builds. So not to have different results for different images based on um, it has now downloaded the new database and you have two more CVs somewhere. Then you use zero, it forces the update, you run the bit back with your image, it downloads the database, you have it, and then you can run all of the builds with the, with the minus one and you are sure that database from that exact moment and you, you know what you have checked for. <coughs> now, what is coming next? Uh, coming next is a small revolution because NVD is changing its, uh, is changing its uh, format. They are re retiring the JSON format the Octa project uh, Panela has been using for years. And they are saying that they will stop the 
current format in March this year. Funny. Um, so um, we cannot bet that they won't do it because everyone will start screaming because there are, there are a lot of projects using it. So I assume that w they will actually deactivate it and then everyone will be screaming, but well. Uh, the new format uh, is an API that allows to get the same information, but the API requires to get a key for every user. And you need to register with, with them to get the key. Uh, you get it in one minute, but, but still it requires to be um, the registration. Current fetcher is completely anonymous, as you can imagine. So um, we need to make a decision if you want to host a fetched copy somewhere or if everyone will be uh, going for the keys to, to do the fetcher. I'm still thinking about it. The current version of the fetcher I have, it's a little bit standalone, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm, try I'm trying to convince NVD um, to rethink their position on this, uh, on this key uh, statement. For now, I'm not successful, <laughs> but, uh, but trying to. So maybe they are going to change their opinion on the subject, but I'm, sti I'm still discussing. Yes? What are, the terms, what are the terms of use of the data? I mean can you just take it and rehost it openly and do what you want with it? Uh, or is uh, it copyrighted or owned? Or? It's, um, it's open for every kind of a use if you put a statement saying that it comes from the NVD. So the terms are pretty, pretty cool. Uh, what I'm also discussing with NVD is um, to, ha to tell them what, what we, if we are going to host it, to tell them that we are going to, hosting, to be hosting them separately so there's no issues. Uh, if they say it's, it's fine for them, okay. Uh, to make it funnier, Mitra, the other organization doing CVs, they are having a Git repo with their database in JSON format. So there are two organizations not talking to each other. Well, but we cannot use currently the Mitra uh, database because it doesn't have the machine readable um, product and version yet. It will have it, but it will be in the autumn, so it's too late. Complicated. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated. So uh, I'm going to uh, post the first version of the fetcher, the, the, the conversion, um, the format conversion and related, uh, related things. The big uh, the big risk is that it needs to work in Danfall and Kirkston. It will have to. Uh, so um, people who want to test it before, before things happen will be more than welcome because, because that will be needed. <laughs> okay, so time for even more questions. Yeah. <laughs> the microphone. Um, you have these two formats, one for the image and one for everything. Yeah. But the image does not have the bootloader. Yeah. But the client of my client of my client of my client is asking everything what I deliver to them. So that includes the bootloader, but not every native package. Yeah. Uh, we'll need to discuss those things, yeah. How, how we are going to configure which, uh, which, um, which report contains what, what exactly. Is, is there a variable that could be changed? Not, uh, not, 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 not now. That will be something that we'll need to, we'll need to add. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I've, alre I've already heard that, heard that request that something to be worked on. Uh, my priority is have the new fetcher ready first <laughs> because <laughs> everything is going to broke if, if we don't so. There is a variable to say 
don't mention the patched ones, so only mention yeah. the unpatched ones. Uh, there is a variable that says uh, only uh, only tell us about unpatched. Uh, if there would be one that tells like including the native ones or do not include the native ones. I think we could do it. I, if I remember correctly, there was some internal difficulty in, in doing that, but we'll have to re look 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 it again. What what was the problem at that time? Um, micro if with microphone, it will be better. Hi, who's doing the work to update the format to the new format? Just out of curiosity. Uh, on the NVD, it's NVD doing it. Uh, on our end. On our hand, it's me for now. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, if I'm if I'm including a recipe in a build of a particular version, so I've got you know version 1.10 of Nginx or something, and then we run the CVE check against it, and it comes up with some CVEs, it's a problem. I don't know, client says, you know, hands in air, we've got to do something about this. So the response to that could be, well, okay, update the recipe to a newer version that's got the fix in, I suppose, and it would just go away. One version, yeah. But if, if that was, you know, complicated, problematic, if, if I then came in and patched locally to fix the issue, how does that information sort of get, does that get yeah. fed back in to... That's one part of the, uh, the question was how, uh, when, you, when you have a vulnerable version of something, how do you, what do you have an option to update it? So that's what was one of the topic I wanted to talk about, but I was looking at my, uh, at the timing I had, so I didn't have time to, to put in the presentation. So there are two options. One option is you update the recipe to point to the fixed version of that specific package. If you cannot do it, that's what we do in the Kirkstone branch, for example, or on that branch when we have fixed uncertain version of the, of the module and we have patches fixing CVs. What you do is you add the patch as every patch and what you need to add is in the, uh, in the commit message, you need to add a tag CV uh, and then give the, the, give the CV number. Then the checker, then the checker is looking through all the patches you have for your um, for your package. It's looking for those tags. The convention is also to name the patch with the name uh, with the number of CV. Then for humans it's easier. But the f the the checker is getting through all the patches, verifying the tags, and collecting the tags. Uh, which patch is fixing which one, and it's uh, taking that into account in your report. Yeah? Who wanted to ask the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in some cases the package in OE does, does have a different name than in the NVD database. Yeah. So is there a way to fix that? Yeah, there's, uh, when, when the package uh, name in our case has a different uh, name than NVD, um, we have a variable CP product that you set to the, right, um, to the right name. It happens also that the NVD database has a wrong thing. In this case, you write an email to the NVD people describing exactly what you want to be changed and why uh, I add usually links to release notes, change logs, all that helps them to make sure that I'm giving them the right information. And typic typical change in the database in, is in 24 hours, so that's reasonable. I've sent plenty of CPE changes for that. Have you had any responses from this in the last two weeks? Because I've sent about five updates and I haven't had a reply. <laughs> oh, in the last two weeks, now I haven't. Yeah. I, ha uh, I haven't talked with this team. I talked with another team. Okay. Ma maybe they are on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many. How many they are? Probably not too many. But normally it's one day. Yeah. Normal. I, my experience is normally one day, except U.S. holidays, then it's longer.
Okay, one more question. Just out of curiosity, a non-technical -tec question, what did they tell you what they want to do with the data that they are, they are going to collect by everyone needing to register for the database? Uh, it's not totally clear to me. Uh, they, what they explain is they want to do have it a, as an API because it allows a runtime products to look for specific issues, which is a completely different case than ours. Um, and um, the, the registrations of keys how I understand what they are, they are telling, the registration <coughs> of keys and the, the use of keys is mostly for the um, bandwidth throttling. So they, the, server, that the server doesn't go down with too many requests, basically. Which is a valid concern, of course. Um, yeah, but... In our case, it's, uh, it's simpler just to grab the whole database and and then we do not bother the server anymore. <laughs> yeah, we are. I think we are done for now. Thank you all and